Thanks for meeting any friends and thank you for having me and all of that. <laughs> okay, so again. So what I want to talk about today are lab numbers from Black Holes. So you have an expert here sitting in front of you, so you probably heard something, but I will assume that you don't know and I will explain that. In the same way, I didn't know what love numbers were until about three years ago. I'm sure the same was true for the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and the reason I, I got interested in that was that uh, uh, it was brought to my attention that this number might actually be measured at some point. And so, and this sort of caught my interest, and I will tell you, hopefully by the time that I finish, you will understand why. And this, the talk today is based on two papers and ongoing work with uh, Yudam Sheriff, an excellent student at the University, and also with my collaborator, Joey McVeigh, which has been going for quite some time. And so what I will tell you first is uh, what are lab numbers. <coughs> then, as I'm sure you heard, that they actually vanish, these numbers vanish for, for the GR black hole. So this, this makes them a focal point of interest because if they are measured and found not to be there. And then your terminology will even for the... I think so, no? Okay, you don't take no, no, three plus one forward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's still okay. Yes, four D is three plus one, <laughs> and um, uh, yes. So this actually makes them a, a focal point, and in fact, there is interest now in this type of uh, in quantities from several directions. One is. These numbers appear, if you look at in GR, they appear at the order 5 p.m., which has not been calculated yet. And so we need a new method for calculating these effects in, in GR so that they can be separated. So it's like the background at the LHC, and it's actually the same people who are doing these calculations, the amplitude people. So that's the other are, of course, gravitational wave experimenters, GR. A Sorry, I totally missed it. What's the point of computing the slab numbers if they only exist in the quantum uh, no, regime? You calculate 5 pn effects so that you know the, the gravitation. I will explain that the gravitational wave emission spectrum to enough accuracy so that you can tell whether you have an additional effect. Of the lab number. Of BSM physics or deviation from GR. Yes, DVF. So BSM here is deviation from GR. GR. In <laughs> fact, you see that uh, there's a shift. <laughs> and it's the same idea. It's the same idea. You need to calculate the background to enough accuracy, and that requires really um, sophisticated techniques. And uh, there's also now recent interest from the more formal theoretic uh, community in relation to ideas about quantum, quantum black holes and so on. So it's really like a, a focal point of interest. But can I, sorry, can yes. I clarify one thing? So if they don't exist in the classical level, and surely emission of actual black holes is classical, this whole thing is driven just by mathematical curiosity. It has nothing no, to do with the actual if you wait, If you wait, if you wait uh, uh, long enough, you will see that it's not, it's actually physical reality and not mathematical Okay, curiosity. nice to know. Yes. <laughs> okay, and uh, so, so then, right, I will go on to explain why and how to calculate 
lab numbers in the quantum case and discuss whether they can be measured in computational wave experiments or not. And for those of you who are interested, the appearance of non-vanishing lab numbers is also related to the appearance of additional ring down modes after a black hole merger. So there are ways of constraining both of them from the same idea. But I will not talk about it today. So we go on. Do we go on? Yes, so first, the standard expectation, which I want to try to convince you is not quite correct, is that if you have these big objects, the black holes, they are classical and we will not observe any quantum gravity effects. Now, what my premise is that black holes ha have to have some internal structure because of the uh, we know that quantum theory persists also for black holes. They have to be unitary, and so they have to have some internal matter. I don't want to discuss it uh, too much. It's just my basic assumption. And so in this case, what I expect is to that black holes have an external an internal structure and this leads to some observable effect and the question is what is the strength of these observable effects okay and there are many discussions i don't know if you follow the literature about phenomenology of deviations from gr uh, there are many that you should not discuss and but this is again another thing yes so the reason so as i said the expectation is that quantum gravity effects are irrelevant to the black hole astrophysical black hole and the, this expectation is based on the idea that the parameter that in the small parameter that governs the deviation from GR is L Planck over the scale of the black hole, L Planck over Rs. This is true when the black holes are in equilibrium on the ground state. But what I argue is that the small parameter that is relevant for deviations from GR is actually the amount of excitation energy. So you take a black hole. I view the black hole, not the external black hole as the ground state. It gets excited, for example, during a black hole merger or when in an in spiral phase, there is an external field that acts on it. And the amount of the small parameter that determines the deviations is the amount of excitation. In fact, if you look at what LIGO measures, it's exactly that energy. The quadrupole formula tells you that it measures the, um, the emitted energy from the excited state to the ground state. And that quantity, this delta E over the mass, it is small, but can be finite. For example, in a, these black hole mergers that uh, LIGO observes, it's a few percent. But this is just the excitation of the horizon, right? Some quasi-normal modes. No. This is purely classical. Yes, yes, yes. But in this case, this in GR, it's a, just the excitation of the quasi-normal mode. But I argue that if black holes have structures, also that the internal structure would be excited. So you claim, in some sense, that quasi-normal modes will not behave classically. No, the quasi-normal modes, standard quasi-normal modes are excitation of space-time away from the horizon. They will remain also in this case, but there will be an additional branch that is similar, for example, to fluid modes of neutron stars, and that will induce correction. And so your claim that the ring down will not be this abate, will not be describable just by quasi-normal modes, no. by some enigmatic quantum. No, no. it will be. In this case, since this is not the subject of one talk, but in the last I will tell you. So in this case, there will be a prompt 
branch of quasi-normal modes that are the standard quasi-normal mode. And in fact, there will be long-lived long long additional quasi-normal modes starting sometime after the, the merger, separated by time from the uh, standard quasi -normal. It's strange that M Planck doesn't enter at all in your parameters, so don't consent. <laughs> in in this situation, in in the, in the equilibrium, this is the correct parameter. But in this case, you have a large excitation, so you can view it as a semi-classical uh, excitation. Okay, now what do I mean by an interior? So this is supposed to be a picture of a black hole. It's not a picture, not of a black hole, but it still helps to uh, visually focus the ideas about what I mean by the interior. So what I mean by the interior is the quantum state, or, right? The quantum state, the state of the matter that collapsed and fall and, and, and created the black hole, and you, there is a, some spherical object, and this is a, it's, it's a visual picture of that object. So, yes, and classically, as we know, this state is causally disconnected from the exterior. So is that expression, I never give it any thought before, supposed to work both inside and outside, but just not at the boundary? Sorry, I... That expression for the metric, yeah. is that meant so, to be valid inside as well as outside? No, no, that, oh, that is that something was the that is outside. Okay. And, and in fact, as we will see in the context of this talk, the only difference between a black hole and a quantum black hole are the boundary conditions on the surface of the deformed, the, the deformed object. So you, you have some excitation, the object deforms. This is also true for classical black holes. And it's the boundary conditions for the equations outside on the surface that, and in fact, it's a single it's boundary sweet. condition. It's something like the way monopoles uh, yes. evade the uh, decoupling theorem. Right, and it's a single boundary condition. That's the amazing thing about that in the case of the lab numbers, the, the electric, the, the electric lab numbers. I thought the... Schwarzschild works inside quite well. You just need to reinterpret the parameters. So you do that, I do something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, it's not, it's not working probably because of the zoom. It's supposed to... There's a delay. Maybe there's a simulation. This is a simulation of LIGO, and this should be the uh, anyhow. So it doesn't matter. This was supposed to ring around, uh, and uh, this is a, a view of the deformed horizon as it uh, oscillates due to an excitation. Okay, so this is during the merger. During the merger, we'll have a large excitation and decay to equilibrium and during an inspire you have small transfer of energy if you have an internal structure small transfer of energy from the orbit to the internal degrees of freedom and that is the, the mechanism that allows to do that. okay so what are lab numbers Lab numbers are just the classical gravitational progressibility of compact objects. Lab is a name. Uh, it's a name of an English mathematician who studied first tides on Earth, on Earth. And because these are tidal effects, these are called lab numbers. And they were studied for quite a long time, not not such a long time. Uh, the, and then in the context that they are thought about is in the context of an inspiral, a binary inspiral of a, a binary compact, binary compact stars. 
one of them exerts a force on the other because the frequency of the rotation is much smaller than the natural frequency here. You can take the limit, the static limit. So it's as if you are having a static gravitational force acting on a compact object. And the lab numbers, in this case, I'm, I'm focusing on the L equal two electric lab number. You can do the same for the higher Ls and there are also magnetic lab numbers. So it works very well. And not to be confused with real ENM. Yes. <laughs> so, so, but uh, they are just the, the analog of the right. so like electric and magnetic part, in fact, of the wild tensors in this case. And, um, and in this case, the reason that I focus on that is because this is supposed to be the largest one. And if there's any chance that something will be measured, it's probably in this one. So I'm focusing on it, but it's possible to do it. Okay, and so you see, you calculate the force, the, the force field on an object from the other uh, partner. There is some, this is fixed by the external field, this term. And the, uh, sorry, this is fixed by the external field, and this is the response of the object to the external field that it is exerted. So it's it, the complete analog of, of electric polarizability. Okay, and, and the, there are numerical factors in the sign that are conventions uh, so that the uh, lab numbers for neutron stars come out to be positive. Um, okay. So now. And that R was the radius of the compact object. Right. Separation. Right. Yes. Thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh, by now so I'm used so to used to it. Right, so. Right. <laughs> Please do that also <laughs> as I continue because it helps me. <laughs> Thank you. I just remember I was confused. I I <laughs> yes. So the the way that you <clears throat> so this is the second uh, important uh, point is that they vanish uh, for the four dimensional PR black holes and. This was known by calculation for, for a while. People uh, just found it, uh, if you wish, by, by group force calculation. You, you saw what you do in, in general in this case, you sort the perturbative equations, you put boundary conditions, and you just check the, the different powers in GTT and you find the coefficients from there. So it's a completely straightforward calculation. And they found that it's zero. And the reason that it's, well, this will become clear. And then recently, Sergey and also Lampwood from Colombia uh, noticed that this vanishing of the lab numbers uh, is associated with the, Sergei, so associated that with the symmetry. I'm sure that you heard about it. And, and Lamy is doing something that is uh, somewhat different, but they explained why the love numbers vanish to some extent. And but it's not something which you can explain to us in three minutes. Sergey will explain to you. Not not in three minutes. I remember. I asked wow. you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not something uh, obvious. No, the the. Um, so the, the simplest explanation is that you solve, right, it's a second order equation. You have a decaying and an increasing mode towards infinity. And the lab number is the coefficient of the decaying mode. And if in DR black holes, that decaying mode is 
singular on the horizon, and so you need to, the coefficient needs to be zero, and that's why it's the lab number is zero. That's a this the simplest technical explanation. But I think the explanation that Sergey has, you know, so to some extent them are much nicer. I got this group. So what should I do? But it's not something obvious, right? It's not something which you can feel in your guts. No? Right? It's just some. You can prove it, but you cannot feel it. Nice. It's very puzzling. Oh, it is puzzling. Okay. It's kind of tells that the whole behavior essentially is like point particles. There are no higher order static responses to the constraints. Are it special to four dimensions, Sergey? Uh, not really. In high dimensional black holes, love numbers vanish for some subset of orbital numbers. At least in our, well, I wouldn't call what we did as explanation, but observation. So that with some approximate symmetry and this vanishing of love numbers is shaped to uh, like highest weight properties of corresponding representation. And so the symmetry exists in any number of dimensions, but the solutions belong to highest weight representations only for like this orbital number taking special values in higher dimensions. Um, but it's actually a very interesting structure. Okay, so. Now, the thing is that with Blackboard, so typically what you do is you solve the perturbation equation on compact objects, and the boundary condition that you put, you put regularity at zero and the continuity at the surface. But with black holes, you can't do that. So you replace it, these two boundary conditions by some addition, other boundary condition on the horizon and at infinity. Okay. okay. Now, in this case, the, in GR black holes, they, get, they do get deformed, but that deformation is not reflected in multiple moments that it measures that it feels. Now, what is it that you need? So now it's moving. What is it that you need to have lab numbers non vanishing? And again, I'm talking about four dimensions, concentrating on the, the electric quadrupole number. Is that either you need new internal fluid like modes, so there is a physical deformation of the object, or no horizon, or both. Okay. And this uh, quote that I have here is that the, the difference between this case and the GR case is that deformations do not produce physical effects. At for observers at infinity. So now I'm moving to my quantum lab calculation, and I want to remind you this will be very similar to uh, the, the electric polarizability of a quantum atom. And so I want to remind you how this is done. Sakura. And so what happens is, right, you, we have an atom, it's neutral, you put an electric field on it, it gets the, in, in quantum terms, the ground state gets mixed virtually with the excited states, and the result is a non-vanishing electric polarization, and the coefficient of that electric polarization is a uh, quad polarizability. And the lab numbers are just these numbers for a gravity. And you see it's a second order time independent perturbation here. In fact, looking at your paper after our discussion, I think you have a diagram with two Qs. 
which is uh, similar to this. So, right, so now I repeat the same thing for uh, quantum slab numbers, quantum polarizability, quantum polarizability, gravitational polarizability. So the interaction now is as indices, I will, you can remove the indices by you know, looking at the tensor structures. And what I'm interested in is in calculating the, the induced quadrupole in the ground state, so for the black hole. And the, the relationship between the coefficient here and this coefficient is like so. Now, it turns out that for quantum black hole, in general for very compact objects, the K2, the love number, comes out negative. In fact, that's interesting and it's related to the how the mass function, you know, the function of the radius works. Okay, so this is also something that was observationally found. And here, yeah. M of R is the mass inside radius R. Yes, yes. It's, so it's the mass of the object. As you uh, go in. No, so. Uh, it's like for a neutron star. Okay, Sorry. let me explain. So for black holes, you have a solution for each value of the mass. Right, you have black hole. And, and then the question is, how does the radius change when I increase the mass, or how does the mass? The short shield radius. Yes, right. so that we know. Now for neutron stars, you can increase the, the size is limited, but you still have some variation in the mass. And it turns out that the mass actually, what did I say? The, it's not even known, right? It may have well, curves in it. Uh, yes, so, but the, for example, uh, Thorne actually claims that this is the, the case, and from the signs that uh, that I see, it actually. No, I mean, if you look at models of the equation of state, some of them have it being sort of what you would expect naively, right? But others actually, it turns around. And okay, it's so in that, that okay, so okay. that's actually very interesting because this might have also oh, but, uh, some. Um, relevance for neutron stars because this is a way of probing also the equation of state at the core, which, as you pointed out, is unknown. In in fact, if you think about what the options, they're not that great. I mean, it really needs to be very exotic matter. But it cannot be that simple, right? Because for a neutron no. star, you have crust, no, no, and what you call radius has no. nothing to do with the resulting gravity, right? No, it it's all much more simple. complicated. Much more complicated. Okay, so let me go on. And now, so what I do is I calculate the polarizability using second order time independent perturbation theory, and I get a very a similar relation to the lab number if depending on the internal structure of the black hole. Except now I don't understand what are the quantum numbers and m. They are to indicate some state of a black hole somehow. Yes. But m what exactly do they mean? So and let me go on and then I will try to explain. So what I will argue in this case is that the best way of thinking about it is since we are looking at large excitations, I can use the Bohr correspondence principle and do uh, semi-classical waves rather than a uh, quantum states. So this is the strategy they would be for. Okay, so as so in this case, now we we don't know what the internal spectrum of black hole is. But this equation is telling you, given a model for the spectrum of the black hole, what it gives you the love number in terms of that number. And in this case, you see that <clears throat> probably we expect that the spectrum, the microscopic spectrum of black holes will be very dense. And so I can turn it into a, a spectral function. And this gamma 
You see, in this case, uh, gamma is a parameter that tells you the, the quadrupole dimensionally has to be something like er squared. And gamma is the, is the parameter that tells you it's a numerical parameter, presumably order one uh, or, or smaller, that tells you what is the actual quadrupole number. And you see that in this case, this object does have an H bar. And what I will be looking at are excitations that essentially have one over H bar worth of energy in them. So they will be semi classic. Yes. So it turns out that the, yeah, so, and this is a, just here a justification why uh, observation numbers are large in the region that I'm looking at and why I can use semi-classical um, semi analysis. Now, again, so the problem now is reduced to finding the spectrum the internal spectrum of the black hole, of the quantum black hole, and then I use the work correspondence principle to write classical wave equation that will reproduce that. Okay, and what I, so, yes, so here is a, an estimate of the, the quantities involved. Now I'm moving the quantum numbers are those of the coherent excitations. And I repeat the, the expressions that I had before. And I can now have an ex explicit expression in terms of this, these functions n of e, gamma of e, a of the lab number, the quadrupolar number. And as usual in this case, the dominant, we expect that the dominant contribution will come from the low lying state, also because the quadrupole is expected to be large. So, yes, so now I'm estimating in this case, I'm using this approximation that there is some discrete spectrum of waves similar to fluid modes of compact stars. And I'm uh, taking the approximation that this sum is dominated by the first excited state. This can be, we checked it in, in some models and it looks reasonable, but at, the po at this point, I just want to show you that you get something which is not L Planck suppressed. This is my main point, not so much the detailed values of the of the objects. And in this case, you see that you get something which is a, related to that frequency. That frequency is expected to be one over R. No, when it's so suppressed, there's a typically a coupling, for example, in the string models that we looked at, it's a string over a plank, so G string squared times one over R. So there is some perturbative parameter associated with the additional scale of the theory that enters into this. But what can this parameter be, right? Because if it is one over R, then it is over the unity, it is very interesting. If it is much smaller than one over R, then no. it is irrelevant. Yes, so it's smaller than one over R, but not microscopically smaller. So let's say one tenth. And this one tenth is uh, alpha prime of M Planck. Or Something like in the in the string model is like that. We also have an, a model where this is a cavity, and I, I'll show you one explicit example. Yes. So again, so now if you come up with some model of a quantum black hole, I can relate it to a lab. So here is a microscopic example. This is a something in fact that I added after my talk on Monday in Colombia because they asked me 
to do that. And in fact, this is a model that we used a long time ago. And the idea is to describe the black hole as a, max, as a maximal entropy state. So each sphere in the black hole is a, as maximal entropy as bekenstein hawking entropy. And if I assume that, I can uh, write the density of state uh, in a straightforward way. And in fact, you get an equation of state from for this type of object, which is p equals rho, which is the equation of state of highly excited streets, long streets, unique equation of state, because this is in a general dimension. Can I have something sure. in the slide before? The we have like delta energy over the mass of the black hole. Yes. But we would say that because the black hole has a big entropy, has a lot of degrees of freedom, delta energy should be proportional to e to the minus entropy. So that is super, super tiny. The, yes, but you remember the, that what I said is that I'm looking at coherent states. So these are coherent oscillations, collective oscillations of many, many of these microscopic states. And these have energies that are small but finite compared to the energies of the world. And, but here, I don't do that. Look, I just put the spectrum in, the spectrum that I found, it's really very thin this space because the total, and total entropy is SVH. And I just do this integral. It's uh, if this gamma of omega, remember gamma of omega is the quadrupole moment for a given energy. And this gamma comes out to be this quantity, which is the small parameter, but not microscopically small. And the R to the five gets uh, uh, sub divided by the definition of K2. And so we get something you see that is order one, but smaller than one. Uh, again, I don't want to push that too much, but it's just an example of how, how this works. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're calculating here is not a quantum correction to classical lab number. It's kind of a just calculation of the full lab number recasting the quantum language. Yes. But then, and I think well, what you showed is that, well, basically that's the usual argument that on dimensional grounds of kind of one expects love numbers to be like efficient to be all the one. But then can we know that black hole is described by jar. So and that kind of a surprise, but the calculation that then as a result of doing the calculation so, we get zero that by respect to the so one. Guess, yes. And so let me show you how this works in the standard way. This is coming next. Okay. Okay. So, and this is another calculation, you don't see it, but it's just to see that in this case, we model the black hole like a, a, a cavity which is reflecting boundary from the inside, and then you can actually calculate that, and you get again something which is a, a small parameter, but order one. But wouldn't you admit that what you are doing is highly unconventional, right? Of course, because of course. In the standard, world external field classical gr you get the answer period i know zero right. so so you agree that you yes, are yes. really messing up with the standard wisdom i wouldn't call it messing up i'm uh, saying that it needs revision right okay so now i'm uh, i think i'm answering your questions so what is the, the relationship to of what i did to the standard calculation and there are two ways of doing the standard calculation. One is uh, using the geometry, the metric, you write perturb perturbation equations, which I will show, and then you calculate the, you see there's one term that the induced one goes like R, R cube, the external field goes like R square. You know the coefficient of the external field, and you calculate the coefficient of the induced one by solving the perturbation equation with boundary control. Yeah. Another method which is more closely related to what I was doing is, and I'm working in the cowling approximation, so the standard 
but in normal modes of space time, I'm ignoring it and I'm looking just at the internal fluid modes of the Earth. And this is uh, done here. And in this case, I treat it as I will explain. I, they are treating the, the, this object as a collection of four harmonic oscillators, and they can calculate the lab number using this. So in a similar way to what I do. Sorry, can I ask? So if you do this calculation, like if I were to do it, I would simply require that there will be a non-singular horizon. I will never go beyond the horizon, right? Oh, okay. So I'm doing this. I'm ahead of you. Okay. So this is the standard calculation. You see this, uh, there are three uh, perturbative quantities. One is the GTT, VRR, and the angular part, the spherical symmetry forces the two h0 and h2 to be equal and then you can just solve the equation in terms of this parameter x which is a one on the right and so you get some kind of the expansion you get a c1 and c2 these are the parameters that are associated with the facing mode and there and k K2 is the ratio between. Okay, so that's the standard standard. And so and as you will see in GR, what will happen is that the C1 will be zero. And in my calculation, C1 will not be zero. And another way which is closely related to what I was uh, showing is doing, is, as I said, describing the oscillations of the fluid or the, the object, an internal oscillation in terms of a bunch of Lagrange uh, deviations, and they satisfy simple um, uh, force uh, harmonic oscillator equations, which I teach in my physics one course. So I should know. And uh, there are explicit expressions for all the quantities. And recall that we are looking at in the static limit. So this omegas, the omega is much more than the omega n. Omega n is the, the normal uh, frequencies. And I can repeat this calculation and get a value for k2 which as you can see already is closely related to the quantity that I calculate, it has the same structure. And it's uh, also useful to uh, define this quantity, the induced energy. I go through the calculation and um, I also define on the way I think the internal energy is just the harmonic oscillator energy per harmonic oscillator. And I substitute into the original equation. I assume here also that the dominant contribution comes from the low line state. And the simplest uh, approximation is just assuming that it comes from the first excited state. And you see that you get. A, an equation which is very similar to the one that I got. Now, the two methods have to agree because they calculate the same quantity. So this way you get a relationship between the spectrum and the boundary condition that you have to impose on the deformed surface. It, it turns out that if the spectrum doesn't exist, the boundary condition is C1 equal to zero, and then the lab number vanishes. And if you have a spectrum, you have a real deformation, C1 is non-zero, and the lab number doesn't vanish. And let me show you how it's done. But before that, this you don't, I'm not expecting you to read it, and I will not read it 
forth. So it's just a showing that we had, we sort of discussed very explicitly the conditions under which this type of comparison is valid. And we argued that it is valid for black holes. And the main assumption here is the same assumption that I used before is that I have it, I can describe effectively the interior of the black hole as a collection of waves with a discrete spectrum, which is something that you get in reasonable methods. Okay. And the then, modes you're concerned with are all higher L modes, right? If they were just uh, we can do this, symmetric, yes. it would do nothing. The reason that I'm using, I'm looking specifically at L2 is because this is the one that couples to the rotational waves and can be moved. Right. But you can do the same thing for all the higher I mean, it wouldn't have, they would be sort of stuck there, is that right? And no. they would last forever, it would never reach No, 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 they have expressions that are very similar to it this and in fact they are usually suppressed and also you have a magnetic type i uh, just was thinking of maybe i i'll ask you later yeah. so so you can repeat that for and they were also done previously and you can repeat that for higher end you can repeat that for no, the, i wasn't thinking of calculation but about the physical object so if you make a more massive black hole by merging two yeah. But you can and imagine. You will have created a thing presumably with these modes. Right. But the L equal two modes can radiate gravitational right. waves and they'll go away. Right. But then will the remaining object be staying there, kind of vibrating For, forever? No, because I think that they have that there is some coupling between the the, say the octopole and the quadrupole. There should be some I was coupling. thinking about the monopole. The monopole is just means that the mass is increasing. Or not just vibrating. Ah, no, that's uh, not allowed in gravity. There's no scalar mode. It's well, that's why I'm, I'm confused. Oh. It seems like what you're doing would imply that. No, I, I think uh, this is a gauge mode. You can gauge it on the scalar mode. But since we don't quite know what we are talking about, <laughs> okay. we can just yes, you can. Yes, you can imagine, but uh, you can imagine, but uh, that you have a scalar mode. But I don't. Okay. okay, so, so, question? yes, this model with the oscillators, uh, it claimed that this reproduces uh, what we expect of the spectrum of a black hole. No, what I'm saying is that if I'm thinking about coherent oscillations of black holes, so in that sense, that's the spectrum, then I do expect oscillation, I do expect the spectrum. So think about this. This way. Suppose that you excite a black hole. Also in GR, it does have this type of the oscillation, so quadrupole oscillations. So these are excitations of the, of the gravitons outside the black hole. It's not the quote unquote excitations of a quantum black hole. But right? in, the, in this case, since eventually what you measure are only quantities of infinity, you can tell yourself whatever story that you want as long as it's consistent with the result. So if you don't want to think about it in these terms and have a, a, an alternative a fact a way of thinking about it, that's okay. But, but you, the, the point is in this case is that if there, there's a difference, the GR deformation does not induce a moments at infinity. And if you have a real physical object that deforms, it does. That's the real distinction. And you can phrase it in, in different ways. This is the way that I phrase it. Now, here there is a discussion of what happens at the boundary. Again, I don't expect you to read it. There's a, a, a summary that, that we, we did here, and you can read in our paper the discussion. The point is, that in this case, the boundary condition, if I want to reproduce this type of oscillation, is different. One single boundary condition on the deformed surface is different between the GR black hole 
and this uh, and the quantum black hole with the oscillations. Okay, so that's that's the difference. And the deformation is small, so you can do a perturbative expansion, and you can, in this case, relate, find what the boundary condition on C1 that you need to enforce so that you reproduce that, that answer. And the answer is the way I would phrase it is like so. So in this case, you see that in the, the difference is in the boundary condition that you have to put on the deformed boundary. Okay, so now I'm moving to my last part, which is uh, can love be measured? <laughs> There's endless ways of uh, playing around with this. I try to tone it down, but from time to time, <laughs> from time, to time I, I cannot uh, resist. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, so, um, right, so. The, the question is, in this case, is whether, a la, to what extent can a lab number, which is not microscopically small, but is order one, probably like a one tenth or one hundred, can it be measured? And the idea, the idea, of how is it, how is it measured? This, as I said, the key element is that you need to transfer enough energy from the orbit to the internal modes. And to do that, because the amount that is transferred in each orbit is very small, you have to have many orbits. And that's why it's unlikely that a LIGO or terrestrial, even improved terrestrial experiment are measured, it's because they don't have enough, they don't follow the merger for enough time. Uh, so I'm thinking about LISA type sensitivity and the parameters that I'm using is are these and you see this is something like 10,000 cycles that they can follow. These are reasonable number accepted as a sort of benchmark numbers uh, when discussing that. And I'm taking uh, some you take two of the order of one over a hundred or one over ten, and and you see that in this case, what what they measure best is the phase of the waveform of the emitted gravitational wave. That's what they're most sensitive. And there are typically three contributions. One is the um, it's the standard GR. Calculation. That's where the amplitude calculations come in. We need to do that very precisely. The tidal deformation that the lab number. And then there's also tidal heating, which I'm assuming for reasons that we really should understand, that is small. And yes. Sorry, are the lab number still zero if I consider Einstein gravity with higher derivative corrections? Yes, but uh, in this case, we're talking about large black holes, so the value of this coefficient, this actually Sergei calculated and, and what the, the value is microscopic. If you assume that they are coming from fundamental theory at a very high scale, which I assume that you also. But is there a way to like, you're saying the way, the, the form of the correction that you obtain is different from the form of correction of those corrections? Probably not, but this the, the strength is, okay. uh, is much larger. The whole point is that you don't get turns that are suppressed by implant, but they're really they're proportional to delta E of Okay. So and there are standard expression in this case saying what is the tidal deformation phase difference when you have a non-vanishing lab number. They are here in, in the example, we actually use the, the explicit um, expression that the gravitational wave experimenters use. My student, Yutang. 
And uh, these are the parameters that we use. We assume in this case a binary at two gigaparsecs, so quite far away, and the mass of equal mass of a million solar masses, which is again something reasonable for DISA. And these graphs show um, this is, I think. This is three sigma value, the, the dotted graph. And so something below that is something that you might say detected. And you can see in this case, this 0.18 is essentially is a, a limiting a maximal value. You should ignore it. This it just means that there's nothing below. But you see that what happens is that there are some cases where the results lie below the three sigma, so they are detectable. And you also, in this case, see that you need to have slight spin. Our preparation were for Schwarzschild black hole. We can uh, we did some estimate of corrections for fair black holes. But these are the reason that you have this thing, that it's better to have spinning black holes is a, mostly because part of the energy of the spin is going to the orbit and then to the internal structure. And also because the innermost spherical ISCO, like innermost spherical, somebody help me. Stable uh, is smaller for uh, spinning black holes. So you can see that I would, the way I would read this graph is see that it's not impossible to detect lab numbers of the order of magnitude that I presented. That's why I think it makes them very interesting. Uh, what we are doing now is we are looking at a very interesting possibility. I'm not sure how much it will be actually realized in experiment, but if there's a resonant effect between the orbit and the internal frequency, then you can put in much more energy into the internal structure and that can enhance the, the effect. And what we checked, we don't, it's not the published paper yet, but what we checked is that it is possible to get to a resonance um, condition before the object become relativistic. So when these expressions that I use are, are valid. So this might be very interesting. So okay. again, I have the same curiosity. So that delta energy is the energy in the coherent states of the black hole. Well, here now it is no. So now it's in this case, it's actually the total, eventually, it's the total transfer energy from the orbital energy to the internal structure. So it doesn't really matter in this case whether I, the description that I describe in terms of this coherent state is correct or not. The only thing that matters eventually is how much energy is transferred into the internal structure. So if you don't like the, the wave picture, use a, some type of, uh, for example, we could do it. I didn't want to mention it because I think it's a, not a good model, but we can do it for a record. Suppose that you do area quantization of black hole, you get a spectrum, and you can do the same calculation for that. And if you have a better model of a black hole coming from string theory and so on, which I hope to have, then you can also put that in. And then these expressions are valid. And you just need to know the absorption, the, total, the absorption, the rate of absorption of external energy into the internal structure. So in this case, you excite either virtually or real excitation of the internal structure, and then that gets emitted in, in gravitational. 
And G was the fraction of the orbital energy that gets transferred. I forgot what little g No, was. this <laughs> little g is a, a, this perturbative parameter that I called before gamma. So I now parameterize gamma in terms of the wavelength in G. It's a, it's a, in the model, it doesn't really matter. It's a, well, it gives us an idea of yeah, what so, physics you're talking about. So in this particular model, also in the string model, that G square is the spring coupling. So it's the number of order, let's say 110, 125, whatever. And it also, in terms of these uh, modes, it is V square over C square. So these modes, the relativistic modes cannot exist because of the boundary conditions. And these are, so these are non-relativistic modes and the amount that they are non-relativistic is that number. So it's some number, a small number, but uh, not microscopic piece. And yes. So with that, here are my conclusions, which are also the third slide. I hope that by now, at least, you know what love numbers are. And uh, as I was showing before, I, I argued if this picture that I described is correct, then they will be accessible to measurement. And what's nice about that is that if you know the internal structure, this means that that internal structure is also excited during the merger. And so it will also control the, the decay, the quasi-normal the, the mode after the black hole measure, in addition to the standard the quasi normal mode, and we already did a little bit of analysis uh, of that kind, like what you So, thank you. Uh, you talked about quantum black holes, but what's the difference between, instead of quantum black holes, I use the word uh, boson star or neutron star. Yes, so, change. okay, so uh, the general framework will not, will not change. The difference here is that I assume that the object is as compact as a black hole, or, or okay. now a boson star cannot be compact of a black hole, it must be much larger, and so uh, N yeah, probably doesn't exist, but that's another another question. Uh, and so, in that case, you will get the calculation will proceed in the same way, but the results will be different. I, I didn't do it for uh, for neutron stars. Okay, so let me let me say this. There will be a, a, an important difference if the object has a photon sphere or not. If it, has a, if it doesn't have a photon sphere, then this type of calculation needs to change in a dramatic way. Okay? Now, typically creating a compact object that has a photon sphere is very problematic. As I'm sure that uh, you know there are lots of, it, it needs to, be composed of exotic matter and it has to have special properties. So in that sense, there are not many options for this type of work. And in that sense, so in fact, we have now following the same logic, we have the, what we call the frozen star with uh, some hint to how black holes were called before they were called black holes. And uh, this is a, a classical uh, geometry, with, uh, which seems to be consistent with all the, all the constraints, non-energy condition, and so on. And we can repeat this type of calculation. And there we do find the oscillatory modes. And so in that sense, this, I think also what I answered to Ahmed, right? Uh, if you want to think about it in purely classical terms, it's okay. But 
The point is that I claim that in black holes of our world, they should have an internal clock. And then the calculation eventually, because the LIGO people are, they don't know quantum mechanics. They don't, they don't use quantum mechanics in their, uh, in their estimates, right? They just use classical GR. Quantum. And it works. Yes. So I should be able, in this case, this means that I should be able to describe everything that I do in classical term, and I just show you how to do that. It's just changing one boundary condition in this case. It, this is this, in spite of the fact that LIGO is the most quantum object in the universe, right? LIGO is, has a coherent state of more than a Avogadro number of photons. So, yes, I I'm just to make sure I understood. Yes. Uh, is one of the punchlines that this effect is enhanced due to the vacancy hawking entropy or not? Um, Can I think of it like that or not? No, I think that uh, this doesn't come come in. Uh, well, you use, you use it at some point. So no, I, use, I, I had the, this is because uh, in Colombia and here, okay. People were saying, okay, let's see some microscopic model. So in that case, I, I just showed the microscopic model where it's really thinly spaced. And I showed that in this case, all that matters is the integral over the spectral function. But you have to put a density of states in there. What, yes. What, 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 what was important about, the, about the, that density of states? So what, what in that case, mean? The, there was nothing, as far as I know, nothing special about that. In, in true density of state, we have to insist that it reproduces the vacancy in Hawking entry. Okay. And therefore, the true microscopic spectrum has to be very thinly spaced, right? Because the energy is mm -hmm. in black hole and you have to put the uh, E to the S it to stays the S in. Is, but, but this is. They are so thin this space, and you are putting in so much energy that that's the details of that uh, distribution. I think are not important. Okay. Just okay. The just dimensional analysis size of object of size r, you expect the sum numbers in, like even by for the one and one the large units. So yeah. in some sense, I think that was the opposite of putting black hole physics. Was, to me, it sounds like a statement. Okay, for generic object, you expect love numbers to be for the one, but I don't see it where the input is. So black holes are zero. What's here? So in this case, I, this is the what I was try, trying to do in this, uh, the showing how the spectrum and the lab numbers and effects that C1. So it's the, the, form, the, the point is, again, that it is, and this is, in fact, common, as you point out. So if I did the same thing for a neutron star, imagining that it's compact enough so that it's within its photon sphere and these mode decoupled from the standard polynomial, no, no, I would get a similar result. So the key is whether you have some internal excitation or not. And if you don't have an internal excitation of the R black hole R, the lab number will vanish. And what I showed here is that you, if you do have it, internal excitations, then it comes out, the naturalness is stored in Does that ask you? Yes. So basically, you are saying that certain observable associated with love numbers, like if one does this calculation differently, like the way, that it gets really all the one different from classical GR answer. But, but is there, wouldn't one expect that then all other properties of Such form, as? Well, like, why is it normal? Mode? So like, what they said that also all, all but even problems, worse, even the more. merge rate right, itself, right, because yeah, right. if those yeah. internal right. modes right. affect the boundary right. conditions, oh. the merger proper, all calculations of protons right. should be thrown right. away. Because I don't see Everything. anything special from okay. GR calculation, I don't see anything special so about that particular thing. Absolutely. Okay, so. so let me, so the particular thing is that you have something that looks like a horizon. So let, let me tell you how this is reflected in the spectrum of quasi normal modes. Okay. I think Andre is right. One should really talk first about the The event proper, the merger itself will be modified. 
it will be modified, but I don't expect it to be modified in significant way. I can, I, again, this is a too technical a discussion, but I can explain to you. I thought about that, and if you wish, I can tell you. What do you mean? Where significant means it's like the square of the small number or something like that? No, then? what I mean is that the merger will not be that different from. What do you mean by that different? Would you say your love number is that different or okay, not? Okay, so a let's discuss. It's a semantic. So, <laughs> if you say, is one tenth different or not different? Okay, so, so let me, let me explain. First of all, I, I'm working towards understanding that question, so I cannot answer oh. it specifically. But so let me tell you how the calculations for the merger are done. So basically, you have the in spiral up to the east core is something is Newtonian gravity, so this should not this doesn't matter. And from a few short time after the merger. This is again Newtonian gravity. The difference in that case, I can explain, it's a small difference. So you have basically a time of order, a few short radius, where anything that you change can occur. Now, typically what they do in this case is that they just interpolate between the two. That's they mean this, LIGO. LIGO, that's the standard <laughs> way. And since, since the you know you the you get very close to each other sometimes even pass because you can do an, a, this type of a extension from the final stage so so in this case there is only a very small window where something could actually be different and in that small window i expect some corrections but not that much but I don't know what the answer is. Now, for the quasi-normal modes, what happens is that the, that you have, I, I mentioned in initial, you have the standard quasi-normal mode coming out in a time scale of Schwarzschild radius after the merger. And these additional modes depend now, it depends whether the final object is rotating or not. If it's non-rotating, you have an additional branch of quasi-normal modes at very low frequency with very large lifetime with a hierarchy between the frequency and the lifetime. The lifetime is much longer than the suppression, much longer enhancement than the frequency. You mean if it is rotating? No, if it's not rotating. If it's not rotating, it's only one tenth, I think, no? The slowest decay. So they come out, the standard one come out, the quasi normal mode, and then there are. Oh, the, your thing. Yes, and okay. then there are additional stuff that comes later with a much lower frequency and a much longer life. So the amplitude is much smaller compared to the standard. In that sense, there are, if you wish, if you, think, if you want to. Say they are invisible. They, when the black hole is rotating, if a small miracle happens because it, the frequencies of these additional quasi normals are spun up to two times the frequency of the rotation of the black hole. And so if you observe the actual merger, you will be able to observe them, but the lifetime is much, lar much longer. And so, in this case, the amplitude of the quasi-normal modes is lower. But as I was emphasizing all the time, that what is important is the total energy that is channeled into these additional modes. So, in that case, the differences are not order one. They are small corrections to the standard GL. In the merger, I don't know, but I expect because of the arguments that I was presenting that the difference will not be that large. There will be some difference, and to actually be able to get to the point that it can be done, I have to be able to find a model that can be that well posed in the sense of gravitational numerical gravitation, and then see what happens. 
and I'm trying to I'm trying to do that. But as I said, I expect that it will not it, it will not be a killer. And a quick question yes. on that. your claim of about how this would arise. Were you saying that in string theory, that that's an example of a no. model? Which I have a, a model of highly excited strings where I can estimate this type of quantity. But it's a, it's a kosher model in the sense well, that- it depends. You know, another <laughs> string theorist wouldn't say it's like a Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. That yes. answered the question. Yes. <laughs> so for the moment, we don't know that there's a consistent physical model Yes. That would admit I, I, this. I, I, yeah, but of I, course, it's definitely something they should look for. Right, right. So, so we are trying to approach this from various uh, points of view. For example, we are trying to create models that are based directly on string theory to do that. And there's a recent activity related to the models that I described on the set of winding modes of strings. And, and so, If there are no more questions, let's uh, move around again. Are you a classicist, Andre? Classicist, yes. What a surprise. I didn't come to take it. I was going to say, it's probably fair that we're investing money and making it happen. Yeah, like, you know, it's a self service. Yeah, it was really nice and clear. Thank you. 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 Thank you.